when I first started to record my lectures, it's way before you know screen recording. I got one of those uh, battery-operated MP3 players, which is also a recorder of sorts. So I would put it in my pocket. I used to wear your shirt with a pocket. And those things are kind of sensitive. It was able to record my heartbeat as well. <laughs> yeah, so it has, it has come a long way you know, from audio-only recording to full you know, screen recording. Sorry? Oh, OK, not talking to me. Does anyone find it useful, the, the recording? Yeah. yeah, OK. It's easy for me to do, you know, so you know, I'm going to do it anyway. But it's good that it's actually useful. OK, all right. It's really useful if you write down the time index. Yep, go ahead. Sorry? Uh, <clears throat> maybe first read the announcements because I think I wrote something about that lecture recording and it gives you the link to YouTube straight to the channel and the videos yep so definitely keep up with uh, the announcements which should also be sent to you by email if you're not receiving the announcements you know, by email, you need to configure um, Canvas to do so. It's under your personal setting. You can actually change that if you want to. But it's important to kind of keep up with the announcements. Some of these are useful. Some are not so useful. So you know, but generally speaking, if it's, if it's completely useless, I won't mention it. <clears throat> All right. So let's see. Yep, it's time to get the class started. Uh, did anyone, you know, actually uh, read the chat GPT, you know, answer? No, no one. You guys don't want to know, you know, how chat GPT can mess up. <laughs> that you're not alone. That you know, this stuff can be a little bit difficult. Oh man. All right. So. <clears throat> This is question number one, okay? But cast it in a different way. So I express you know, the rules as a field trip. So the field trip, you know, Quinton, which is the, the qubit, okay? Quinton is Q1 of the question. So Quinton is going if and only if Xavier, which is X1, or Yuri, which is Y1, is going. So because it's the exclusive or, so that means if and only if, uh, okay, I take it back. That means the one and only one of X, Y you know, can be going, quote unquote, be, be basically being a one. Sam is the sum, okay? I intentionally use you know, the, <clears throat> the first letter of each name matches the name of the role, okay? So Sam is going only if one and only one of Quinton or Kathy is going. So that would be the Q and the K bits, okay? Because the sum bit is the exclusive or between the Q and the K bits. <clears throat> Kaylee is actually K of two, okay? That's the next column. So Kaylee is going if and only is if both Xavier and Yuri are going, which is X1 and Y1, or both uh, Quinton and Kathy are going, which is Q1 and K1. So I'm basically re-expressing exactly the same rules, but this time you'll cast it as <clears throat> your classmates in, a, in the class. So the question is given that Kaylee, which is um, K2, is a one, <clears throat> and Xavier, actually this is wrong because Xavier is not going in the question. So that's why the answer is actually incorrect. But I recasted the, the problem you know, into a word problem, and um, ChatGPT was able to figure out, you know, in this is wrong, okay, but you can just copy and paste it and change this part and say only Kaylee is going, but Xavier is not going. Then you can ask your know, ChatGPT who else is going on this field trip. So the ones that are going are the ones. The ones that are not going are the zeros. So you can follow the same logic, you know, to 
kind of solve all of those unknown bits. <clears throat> so this is a this is kind of interesting because you can you can recast a problem in a slightly different way. So notation you know, does not get into the way of the question itself. Yes. Um, once I fixed it, it got it right, except when I asked it explicitly, is Sam going? It gave me the wrong answer. <clears throat> so chat GPT, you know, okay, this is really ironic because you, you would think that chat GPT being, you know, uh, a computer based, you know, resource can, would get the logic right, right? You know, nope, nope, it got the logic wrong. That has to do with LLM or large language model is typically, not all of them are, but typically they are neural net based. And as a neural net based approach, things are probabilistic, which means they're not definite. It's basically just, you know, okay, if these are the words that I have generated before, these are the things that are likely to be on the next sentence. But it's all probability. <clears throat> so there's no definite application of logical reasoning in the case of chat and GPT, which is kind of interesting. It's interesting from many, many perspectives here you know, because there are some people on this campus that are concerned about you know, people using chat and GPT to do, to do their homework. <clears throat> so the key is for the professor to test those questions with chat and GPT first. Make sure that chat and GPT always make mistakes. Then you can make those questions available to the students. That's what I would have done if I were to teach online <clears throat> and give people assessment questions. But since you know, your exams are all on paper and in person, you know, that is not as much of a concern for me. All right. <clears throat> okay, so what we're gonna do today is a new module, okay, which is comparison. Um, so the way we figure out you know, what is the next topic, let me switch to student view. So this way, you know, all the things that are, <clears throat> that should not be shown, won't be shown. So the way we figure out what is next is look at all the links, right? So we got this link, we got some of the other links you know, related to the labs, <clears throat> and then we got the values, numbers, and bases. This is our base conversion module. And then we got the binary number addition. Um, and then we got a whole bunch of labs. And then we got to subtraction. And then we got to signed versus unsigned integer representation. This is this signed versus unsigned in integer representation. It's the last, excuse me, it's the last topic within the scope of exam one. Okay, so we are not going to ask, the exam one is not going to have any questions about your know, binary comparison. Is that okay? I just want to make sure everybody understands the scope of exam one. It's everything up to and including signed versus unsigned interpretation. So what we're doing today, because we are done with this topic, so what we are doing today is with binary comparison. So that's how we... Uh, figure out, okay, and <clears throat> once we're done with binary co uh, comparison, you know the next one is going to be floating point number representation, because I'm just moving down, you know, one at a time, okay, so you can always read ahead of the class by following these links. Is that okay so far? Okay, all right. So let's get, click on a binary comparison, which is, it looks a lot more complicated than it really is, okay, so I'm going to focus on you know why it is that why it is like that and what you really need to know from this particular module section one says you know only less than is needed in other words of all the different types of comparison they can all be translated into just less than using some boolean operators in other words if i just know how to compare and confirm whether some number is less than another number I can use that combined with logical operators to implement equal to, not equal to, less than or equal to, greater than, and the greater than or equal to. <clears throat> the exact mechanism to do that, we'll talk about that later, but let's just say that for now, we are only concerned about can we tell whether a value is less than 
another value. Are we okay with that? Or does, is, is anyone curious of how we can use just less than combined with logical operators to implement all of the other what we call relational operators? You know, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, those are all, they're called relational operators. No one is, no one wants to know? Okay, there are a few hands. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> so let's do that. And I'm just trying to figure out you know, how, what is the best way to do it. All right. So let me make sure the recorder is on. Yep, recorder is on and the voice is going. And where is my, oh, there we go. Okay. Sometimes I can't keep track of where the window is. All right. So given that you only have less than, okay? X is less than Y, eh, that's easy. What if you want to express X is less than or equal to Y, but you only have less than? Well, you just have to flip it around and say not Y is less than X. Does that make sense to you? Okay, X is less than or equal to Y is the same as Y is not less than X. Does that make sense? This has to do with values, has nothing to do with how a value is represented. Yep. Okay, you can plug, you can, you, if you have any questions, you can plug numbers into X and Y and get a hands-on, you know, experience. So let's just say that X and Y are both fives, okay? Five is less than or equal to five is true. Five is less than five, you know, on this side, okay? Five is less than five is false. Not false is true. Okay, that works out. What if x is 10 and y is 6? Then 10 is less than or equal to 6 is false. On the other side, you have 6 is less than 10. That is true, but not true is false. So it gives us the same result. You know, even though it looks a little bit awkward, it works. Is that okay? So this is what I meant early by earlier what I said, um, you can convert you know, a particular relational operator into just your know, less than, the less than symbol here, combined with a Boolean operator, which is the not operator in this case. Are we convinced so far? Okay, all right. So let's try something that's a little bit more challenging. What about does not equal to? So in C++, you know, not equal to is an exclamation point equal to, and then we have Y over here. <clears throat> so how are we going to express X does not equal to Y, but only using less than, and then some, a bunch of, you know, well, not a whole bunch, just a few uh, Boolean operators. Yep, you're absolutely correct. So that's it. Now, okay. So, it's a little slow. Is it cumbersome? Yes. But the, does it get a job done? Yes. All I care is it gets the job done. Okay. So if we can express that, what about x equals to y? Well, don't you think if you can already express x does not equal to y, x equals y is just the negation of that? Hmm? You can use and, but you don't... Yeah, you can use and. Okay, so there are two ways to do it. This is actually using, um, you can apply the Morgan's Law in this case. So <clears throat> the original one, the lazy one, is it is not the case that x is less than y or y is less than x. Because we know that, you know, without the negation on the outside, it means, you know, that's not equal to. So with the... Um, with a negation, it means equal to. Is that making any sense? But if you apply the Morgan's Law, which is basically the distribution of negation, this really is exactly the same thing. This symbol, by the way, means you know, if and only if, which means if one side is true, the other side has to be true. If one side is false, the other side has to be false as well. So once you apply uh, the Morgan's Law, it becomes something like this. And I'm gonna use extra parentheses just to make sure that we understand you know, where the neg what the negation is applying to. So 
it means that. Which also means you know, y is less than or equal to x, and uh, x is less than or equal to y. The only way they can be less than or equal to each other is for them to be exactly the same. Is that okay so far? Does it make sense intuitively? Okay, if it does not make sense to you intuitively, plug in values, okay? You know, so once again, you know, plugging in values is really helpful to really kind of give you a, um, a number sense, okay? You know, actually value you know, of what it means when I you know, have these expressions. All right, so anyway, this is basically just a long way of answering that earlier question <clears throat> of um, really is less than is all is that all we need for all the relational operators? The answer is yes. Okay, so we are only concerned about less than. So uh, section two is important. It is helpful also, you know, for your um, for things that are within the scope of the exam. But I am not going to refer to VS or VU in this case, because you know, I already gave you uh, the scope of the exam, and this is excluded from exam one in your case. So the whole thing about VU is it is the value, unsigned value, represented by a bit pattern X of M bits. That's basically what VUXM means, is it is the unsigned value represented by X as a bit pattern, and X has M bits. It is, that's the width of X, okay? <clears throat> so do we have any questions about, you know, what V, U, X, M, you know, just this side means? What is the meaning of that? Yep. X is a bit pattern. That's all it is. Um, a bunch of bits. <laughs> yes, it, you can look at it as a number in base two, yep. So X is a number in base two, so X zero, is digit zero of the base two number, x1 is digit one, and so on. Yep. M is the number of digits. All right. And on the right-hand side of the equality, do you recognize this pattern? It's a sigma notation. We have some kind of index, you know, um, variable, and then each term that we are adding is a digit times the base raised to the power of the position of the digit. Does that sound familiar to you? I certainly hope so. <laughs> we talked the first time we talked about this is when we talked about base conversion and how values are num are represented by numbers in different bases. Okay, so I'm hoping that you're studying a little bit and this is already starting to look familiar because I think this is definitely not the first time we see this. Yes? Hmm? Yep, when we talked about base conversion, it, it was more uh, general. So in the base conversion one, I use B to represent, you know, uh, the base, and it was using D for digit I, and then the sigma was going from negative infinity to positive infinity. But it's the same pattern. Yep. This one specifically works for base two number because it is raising two to the power of the position of the digit. So it only works for base two number. So this entire, <clears throat> this entire module applies only to base two numbers. All right. So now, you know, so I hope this one, you know, unsigned number is, or the value represented by unsigned number is no more than the usual base conversion. And all we're going to say is, oh, B is 2, and that's it. Are we okay so far? Okay, so this is just your know, regular base conversion. So what is not so, you know, common is the signed representation, so I'm using the mouse pointer here, the signed value represented by a bit pattern X, and it also has M bits, you know, as the width. 
So this one looks almost exactly the same. So if you look at this parenthesized you know, sigma notation, it looks almost the same as this one here. What is the difference? It's minus two, m minus two instead of m minus one. In other words, the most significant digit is not a part of the sigma notation. I'm not adding it. Okay, I'm leaving it out of the sigma notation. Yes? It, not just that. Okay, so you're correct. Okay, the sign bit, which is the most significant bit of a binary number when it's interpreted signed, is called a sign bit because if that bit is a one, that means the value being represented is negative. So you're correct, but it does more than just that. Because you know, if you want to know the value, the signed value represented by the bit pattern, we can just subtract two to the power of m minus one times you know, the, the bit at the position m minus one, which can be only be a zero or one. Then we get the actual value represented by the signed value represented by the bit pattern. So there's an example here, okay? The next paragraph has a, has a concrete example of 1011. <clears throat> so, and it, it spells out, okay? You know, if you use the VU you know, fu uh, function, what, what is it gonna calculate? 1011 is a bit pattern, that is X. M is four, because it is a four bit number, you know, or we're only using four bits out of the number. So this one, is this one here, this two is digit one, this zero is our digit two, uh, digit two, this is digit one, this is digit two, and the eight is digit three. So unsigned wise, you're just basically adding up all the powers of two. You can either have or not have a, power, you know, a particular power of two, because in base two, each digit can only be a zero, which means we don't have it, or one, which means we have it. And Yoda would have loved binary numbers. Have or have not. One or one not. Two or two not. Four or four not. Eight or eight not. Okay? <clears throat> There's no try, exactly. <clears throat> so in this case, the unsigned value represented by 1011 as a bit pattern, using four bits, which means we're using all the bits, is 11. 11, even though it is a base 10 number, in this case is the value being represented by the bit pattern. On the other hand, if you want to know the signed value of the bit pattern, same bit pattern here, 1011 in base 2, and we're using all four bits here, almost exactly the same thing. This one is this one here. This one is this 2 over here. This zero, I don't even bother to write it, okay? Because zero times whatever is zero. But we have a subtraction of eight because M is four, right? So X subscript three in this case is multiplied to two to the power of three, which is eight. But it is subtracted from the rest. It's subtracted from the addition or the summation of the rest. So as a result, we have one plus two, which is a three, three minus eight is uh, negative five. So we are claiming that one zero one one is representing negative five. You can pull your number wheel out, okay, and see if in that, on that wheel that one zero one one is indeed mapping to negative five. Yep. minus the bit width, not squared, two to the power of the bit width. Yeah, sort of, sort of. <clears throat> but you have to know the range, like when do you apply that rule? So this is actually the, the best way, you know, VS, you know, as it is expressed here, is one of the best ways or easiest way to find out what value is represented by a signed number. Because it doesn't really care whether the most significant bit, which in this case is this one over here, it doesn't really care whether it is a zero or not. The formula works. The equation works all the time. Okay, but somebody is gonna say, but Tech, 
uh, we had you know, another way to figure out the arithmetic negation of a particular value. Do you guys remember that? When did we talk about that? Choose complement, exactly. So it really kind of begs the question of, so if we take the choose complement of the binary representation of five, we should get to 1011 as well. Does that make sense to you? Okay, if everything is consistent, that should work. So let's find out whether that is the case or not. So I'm switching to my tablet here, but I actually have a, I printed this in a special way so that it is, it leaves me a lot of room on the right hand side. So this way, you know, this is the same content as what we saw earlier, except you know, I just have a lot of space on the right hand side for me to kind of write in free form. So this way, you know, I can, I can use handwriting, but in the context of the, the modules that I have also written. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. So we are looking at the two's complement of five, and how do we represent five as a four-bit number? Zero, one, zero, one, very good. Okay, so zero, one, zero, one <clears throat> in base two. So that is the one's complement of the same bit pattern plus one which then equals to the flipping all the zeros to ones, your ones complement is just you're flipping the bits. So we have one, zero, one, zero in base two plus one, which is huh, one, zero, one, one in base two. Whew, we got it back. So the, the method of using two's complement to figure out you know, the, how a negative value is represented works consistently with the VS method. The VS method is just an easier method because it's just summation without two's complement plus one and stuff like that. So are we good with all of this stuff here? Okay, excellent. <clears throat> so for regular presentation, I like the other screen a little more, you know, because your know, things are not really kind of crunched up as much as uh, this screen is not as crunched up as the other one. All right, so section three is long, but you don't have to read a lot of it. So let me just kind of tell you which part you really need to read. Just this part. <laughs> All right, so if you only have to know this much, what is the rest doing here, wasting pixels? Okay, so switching back here, I am going to, oh, okay, wrong tool. Come on. There we go. All right, so I have a highlight tool that I can use. And just get rid of the, there we go. All right, so it's also, there we go. Okay, so this is the portion that you need to know. The rest is kind of like a proof if you're interested in the proof. Okay, but we still have to understand what this means. In a binary subtraction of two ambit patterns, so X is an ambit pattern, Y is also an ambit pattern, T of M is one if and only if VUXM is less than VUYM, assuming T of zero is a zero. What does that mean? What T are we talking about here? <clears throat> Sorry? Yep. So T is the borrow bit. Okay, remember in the subtraction, we have X, Y, Q, T, D as the rows. So T is referring to the row of the T bits, the borrow bits. So in a subtraction like that, T of M is the one bit that is kind of like hanging outside because the difference can only have a D zero all the way up to T D of M minus one because the difference needs to have exactly the same number of bits as X and Y. X and Y are M bit you know, patterns, which means X has bits from zero to m minus one. Y also only has bits from m, excuse me, from zero to m minus one. Okay, 
So I guess you know, it would be nice to do some exercise, right? You know, to just to take a look at all this stuff here. So we'll, that's what we'll do. So I'm going to open my note here. So this is kind of completely free form for me to write. So what we want to do is to figure out, eh, I think you know, a few examples would be helpful. The first one is um, 0, 0, 0 minus 0, 0, 1. And we want to figure out this you know, bitwise subtraction. So at this time, I'm doing this you know, kind of as a review for you for exam one, OK? Because you should be familiar with all of these things already. This is row x, this is row y, this is row q, t, and d. All right. So the q row are the exclusive or between the x and the y. So I can fill those in like so. Uh, T0 is going to be assumed 0 here. And now we have to figure out T of 1. T of 1, T of 1 in binary is the negation of x. OK, I'm going to use the mouse pointer because the pointer on the tablet is, is very, it's not very responsive. So T of 1 is the negation of x and y. So that's a 1 already because the negation of x is a 1 and the conjunction with another one, which is the y, is a 1 already. So we have to put a 1 here already. Um, I don't even need to look at q and t to come to that conclusion. So what about the t bit over here? What about t of 2? So we have the negation of the 0, which is a 1, and conjunction with the 0 here. Well, conjunction with the 0 is always going to be a 0, so that's a 0. But we have a second chance. The second chance is the negation of the q and the t over here. Since q is a 0, the negation of the 0 is a 1. 1 and 1 is a 1. So that means we still have a borrow of 1 over here. And then for t of 3, <clears throat> 0, uh, the negation of this 0 and this 0 here is a 0. So that means you know, we lost the first chance to have a borrow of 1. However, the negation of q is a 1, and t, which is also a 1. So we have 1 and 1. So that means we end up with a 1 over here. Now, we don't really need to know the difference, but might as well you know, compute that too. The difference is the exclusive or between the q and the t. So that means we have a 1 here, 1 here, and a 1 here. Are we doing OK so far with that math? OK. <clears throat> you still have what? Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to study. So hopefully by next Tuesday, this is all going to be very natural for you to do. Because you know, that's kind of like the really baseline of what you need to know for exam one, is to know how to perform all of these calculations. Yep, go ahead. Well, you just have a very small range, but yes, you can. <clears throat> when you don't have when you have zero bits, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense, right? You know, you you <clears throat> when your number cannot have any digits, then you cannot represent you know values anymore. All right, all right. So after this calculation, what are we talking, right? Um, this is t of three. This is t of 3. And in this case, we have three bits, right? So let's take a look and see if that conclusion is right. Because the conclusion says t of 3 is a 1. This is if and only if. So t of 3 is uh, a 1 if and only if, in this case, vs, a uh, vu, sorry, we are still looking at the unsigned interpretation, vu of x, which is 0, 0, 0, and we are using three bits over here, m is 3 is less than VU of you know, the pattern 0, 0, 1 in base 2. I'm going to emphasize this is in base 2, 3, OK? So I'm just repeating you know, what the um, theorem or what the statement is trying to say. But is that true? You know, if you look at this particular example, and let's just say that you can get a refund of all the money that you pay for this class. If I say something wrong, do you think you can get a refund because of this example. OK. I, I was just thinking that you know, the, the concept of refund would motivate you guys to think it's like, I want to get my refund. 
<laughs> but you cannot get a refund because in this case, what is VU of 0, 0, 0, and then the 3? That's just 0. What is VU of 0, 0, 1, comma 3? 1. Is 0 less than 1? Yep. And is T of 3 a 1? Okay, you're not getting your refund. <laughs> let's, let's work out a few more examples, okay, and see if you can get your refund. Um, let's pick, um, oh, these are all really good ones, like 1, 1, 1, minus 0, 0, 0, okay? So they're going to come back later because they have significance in, in some other way in today's lecture as well. So let's do this. Okay, and then we have, so I'm going to speed up, you know, the process of doing all this stuff here. So T0 is assumed 0 in all of these cases. So, okay, fine, this is easy. Uh-huh, yep, okay. All right, so in this case, T of 3 is um, 1, if and only if, VU of 1, 1, 1 in base 2, using 3 bits, is less than VU, me. Uh, of 0, 0, 0 in base 2 using only 3 bits. Same statement in different values. Are you getting your refund back? Well, let's try to figure this out. What is VU of 1, 1, 1 in base 2, comma 3? 7, okay, very good. And 0, 0, 0, once again is just a 0. 7 is less than 0 is false, but Okay, but is T of 3 a 1 or a 0 this time? It's a 0, so that means T of 3 is 1 is also false. False, if and only if false, is true. You're not getting your refund. All right? <clears throat> yes? Say again? Yeah, that is correct. Are you referring to... Let me move my mouse here. This one? Yeah. Yep, it's it's the same statement. But since this less than is false, okay, this entire thing is false, uh, T3 equals to 1 is also false in this case because it is a 1. It, T3 is a 1 is false because it really is a 0, right? Okay, so, when, so the way you write that mm -hmm. is, oh, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, all I'm doing is I'm plugging in concrete values into the theorem that I just mentioned earlier in class and see if the theorem still holds. And so far, the theorem is holding just fine. <clears throat> uh, let's try one more, okay? Well, actually, I think there are two more that we should try. So let's try 1, 0, 0, minus 1, okay? So this time we got 1 here. 0 here, a 1 here, and then a T0 is assumed a 0, but we have a borrow here, we have a borrow here, and then we don't have a borrow here, and then we have a 1 here, a 1 here, and a 0 here. Okay, does that look right to you? Yeah, I think it looks right. Okay, so now we test the theorem again. T3 is a 1, if and only if VU of 1, 0, 0 in base 2, 3, is less than VU of 0, 0, 1 <clears throat> in base 2 using only 3 bits. Okay, so let's check whether you're going to get your refund or not. What is one VU of 1, 0, 0 in using 3 bits? It's a 4, okay. And what about 0, 0, 1? Okay, and 4 is less than 1 is false, not true. What about T3? Is T, does T3 equal to 1 in this case? Nope. Okay, so this is also false. False if and only if false is true. <clears throat> so you're not getting your refund. Last one, okay? So 0, 1, 1 minus 1, 1, 1. Okay, so 1 minus 1 is a 0. One, oops, okay, I have to <clears throat> make sure I don't touch the bottom part of the screen. That's a zero, that's a zero, that's a one. And this is a zero, that's a zero, that's a zero, that's a one over here. 
And then we have a zero, a zero, and a one over here. When it's doing screencasting, it's not very responsive. There we go. Okay. So in this case, are you getting your refund? Okay, I'm not going to write everything again. <clears throat> what is VU uh, 0, 1, 1 in base 2, 3? In other words, it's just 3. Okay, the value of 3. Um, this one we worked out already. VU of 1, 1, 1 in base 2, comma 3 is 7. 3 is less than 7 is true. Is T3 1? Equal, does T3 equal to 1 in this case? Yep. So once again, it is consistent. So I hope these four cases are convincing you that, yeah, it looks like you know the T bit, or the, I should not say the T bit, I should say the most significant T bit is an indicator of whether X is less than Y using the unsigned interpretation. Okay, are you guys kind of intuitively convinced that that is the case. Okay, very good. <clears throat> now, for those of you who are not okay with, okay, I'm not okay with intuition. I need to know exactly that th this is true and I want a mathematical proof. That is the rest of section three. So most people are not, they don't need to read the rest of section three. Okay. But if you have taken uh, CISP 440 and you know what is proof by induction, this is a good way to test whether you truly understand proof by induction or not, because I'm, use, I'm actually applying proof by induction in this case. It's a little bit long, a little bit windy, you know, but <clears throat> if you care about mathematical proofs, you know, it is here. I put you know, all the mathematical proof here because it matters to me, okay? It matters to me whether I can prove it here mathematically or not. I'm not okay with just you know, saying, yeah, yeah kind of intuitively right. Okay, so we are now done with unsigned comparison because you know, the conclusion is, without you know, going through all that proof, is if the most significant T bit is, a, the most significant bit is a one, the most significant bit of the T row is a one, if and only if the unsigned interpretation, interpretation of X is less than the unsigned interpretation of Y. That's it. Okay? What about signed numbers? Well, signed numbers are, in a certain sense, easier, but in a certain sense, actually harder. So let me check the time. Okay, I think we got enough time today. <clears throat> so unlike unsigned, where the actual difference of X minus Y x minus y cannot be its own value. So this sentence basically means the difference, if you look at the difference alone, it cannot represent the actual result of x minus y when they are unsigned. Because 3 minus 5 is supposed to be negative 2. But if you carry out the actual binary subtraction, the actual difference is not negative 2. What is it instead? It's a five with a borrow of eight. Well, actually it's six with a borrow of eight. So it's still negative two, but it's not expressed the same way. <clears throat> um, actually, if I switch back to the earlier example, I can illustrate it. <clears throat> so this is a good example, okay? This is zero, this is one. Zero minus one has a difference of one, 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 which is seven doesn't make sense at all until you look at the overall borrow, T of T3, because T3 in this case means, oh, we owe eight. So that means you have $7 in your pocket, but you owe the bank $8. So your net worth is still negative one, which is correct in this case. Is that okay? Yep. Um, we don't talk about the sign of the T row. The T row has no such thing as a sign. But I mean, if you take the difference, like take the most borrow and make that. You cannot, that won't make sense either. Yeah, that would not, oh, okay, I see, I see what you mean. 
um, then you end up with a four bit signed number. So when you look at the four bit signed number that way, then it does make sense. Yes. Yep. That's a very good point. No, no, that actually it doesn't work. Okay. Well, <clears throat> that actually does not work. I just went through the math in my head and it, it didn't work. Um, let me see. Does that work? It does work. Yes. Because, you know, because, okay. <laughs> so it does work. Okay. <clears throat> so to the rest of the class, you know, the, uh, what, what he's proposing, what Sam, right? Yeah. So what Sam is proposing is if I want a four bit representation of the result of this thing and it is signed, you can just put whatever the T3 is down to the uh, T uh, to D3 and interpret the entire D row as an, as a signed number, then it would actually represent the value correctly. Okay, but that's, that's a good observation, but that's not what we are focusing on in this class at this point, okay? So the focus is when you're looking at only the unsigned representation of X, Y, and D, D does not always represent the actual value of the difference because you know, we have to rely on the overall borrow in order to get the actual quantity of the subtraction. Does everybody understand what I just said? Okay, excellent. All right, so, but for signed number, it is not like that, okay? The reason is very simple. The reason it has to do with signed values can represent negative numbers. So if you only have four bits, you know, for signed representation, you can represent negative eight all the way to positive seven. So indeed, your difference can be negative. So it does have the ability to represent negative values. So if we have that capability, then you know, if you look at this, uh, this part here, x is less than y if and only if x minus y is less than zero. Does that make sense to you in terms of algebra? If you look at the inequality and you subtract y from both sides, do you agree that x is less than y is really saying the same thing as x minus y is less than zero. Okay? But anything that is less than zero has the sign bit, which is the most significant bit, being a one. So that means, oh, so that means we can just look at the sign bit and know whether x is less than y when they are interpreted signed. Okay. Does everybody understand what I just said? Okay. So we look at a few examples, okay, so things that we have done already and see if that makes sense. So in the first example, <clears throat> it works fine, right? Because you know, x um, signed or unsigned, you know, 0, 0, 0 is representing 0. Signed or unsigned, 0, 0, 1 is representing 1. But when we look at the difference or d, it is 1, 1, 1, which means you know, this bit over here, you know, this is d2. d2 is a 1, means that if, we, if I choose to interpret the bit pattern as a signed three-bit number, that would have been negative, right? Well, zero minus one is negative one, and one, one, one does represent negative one. So that means in a signed comparison, okay, when you look at values as signed numbers, you can rely on the sign bit of the difference to tell you whether x is less than y or not until it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so there are cases where it does not work, okay? So out of these four examples, there are cases where it doesn't work. <clears throat> In the first one, it does work, okay? Let me point out which one is this one here. It does work, okay? Beautifully, okay? Because your zero is less than one, you know, signed, and the end result is a negative one, and the sign bit is a one. Makes sense, okay? X minus one, Y is negative, and therefore the sign bit, which is the most significant bit, is a one. That's cool, not a problem. This one works too. <clears throat> because one, one, one is representing negative one in signed representation, in signed interpretation. Zero, zero, zero is always zero. So negative one is less than zero, right? In the signed comparison. The end result here has the sign bit being a one, which is which also makes sense because x minus y should be less than zero, and anything that is less than zero has the most significant bit being a one. That makes sense. Okay, seems like you know everything is working. And then the next two examples doesn't work. Okay, 
So we'll take a look here. <clears throat> one zero zero is representing negative four when we have you know, only three bits. How do we know? Well, there are two ways to know this. Okay, one is you can take the two's complement of one zero zero and flip it around to the positive side, which is going to be exactly the same, which is one zero zero, which means it is um, uh, is negative four. You can also use the VS interpretation. We have zero plus zero minus four, and therefore the value represented by one zero zero is negative four. So I'm referencing the VS you know, definition that we just talked about a little bit earlier. The most significant bit is subtracted, okay? Or the power of two corresponding to the most significant bit is subtracted from the sum of the rest, okay? So this is negative four, this is just one. Negative four is less than one should be true. In other words, x minus y should be less than zero. Anything that is less than zero should have the most significant bit being a one. Uh-uh, not the case. This one doesn't work. Why do you think it is not working? Well, keep that, okay, go ahead. Exactly, okay, because the actual value is negative five, but negative five is outside of the range of values that you can represent as a three-bit signed number, because that only ranges from negative four to positive three, okay? The next one also does not work, okay? Zero, one, one, you know, signed, in, si uh, interpreted signed is three. One, 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 interpreted signed is negative one. Three minus negative one should be a four. You go like, but oh, that's a four. No, it's not a four. Not if you are using VS to, to uh, interpret the value. Because VS says, we are subtracting the four from the sum of the rest. So this is negative four. When you look at the sign, it also does not make sense. Because x in this case is actually greater than y, so x minus y should not be less than zero. If it's not less than zero, the sign bit should be a zero, but it's a one. So once again, it is because it's out of range. Because three minus negative one is positive four. Positive four is outside of the range of what a three-bit signed integer can represent. So, so this means looking at the sign bit works until the result of the subtraction or the difference is out of the range of the bit pattern. So the question is, then how do we know it is outside of the range? <clears throat> As it turns out, it's very easy. So I'm gonna, I will erase a bunch of stuff here, okay? But since you know, everything is still being recorded, it should be okay because you can still, oh, why is it not erasing? There we go, okay. So as it turns out, it's very easy because what we need to do is to take a look at the sign of x, the min of n, the sign of y, which is the subtrahend, and the sign of the difference, okay? Those three things, will tell us whether we have an overflow situation or not. Okay, so we're gonna make a truth table out of that thing. <clears throat> so we're gonna have, in this very specific case, we have x2, which is the most significant bit of x, which is the sign of x, the sign of y, the sign of the difference, okay? And let's just assume that these three bits are quote-unquote independent, which they are not exactly independent, but we'll just say that they're independent so that we can have a truth table. So the truth table is gonna look like this. It's gonna be pretty boring and mechanical to draw the truth table here, okay? A little bit, takes a little more time than the usual because we have eight rows in this case. And then we have zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. There we go. All right. So now we ask the question of is the sign of D2 wrong? Okay. So if X2 is a zero, I just want to know whether X2 is negative or not, okay? If X2 is a zero, 
is x representing a negative value. So it's non-negative, right? <clears throat> so by the same reason, y is non-negative. I'm focusing on the first row. Y is non-negative and the, and the difference is non-negative. Is that possible? You're subtracting a non-negative value from a non-negative value, ending up with a non-negative difference. Can it happen? Yeah, yeah, okay. So that means you know, the sign is wrong. It's not the case, okay? This can happen. Is that okay? <clears throat> what about the next one? You are subtracting a non-negative value from a non-negative value, but you end up with a negative value. It can happen. Um, zero minus one is negative, right? So the sign, yeah, it can, it's, it, it can happen, which means it is definitely not wrong. Uh, it means you know, whether the sign of D2 is wrong or not. Yep. So we are looking at the sign of D2 and go like, is it even possible? If it is possible, we put a zero here, which means, you know, yeah, it can happen. But if it is not possible, we put a one there and say, you're definitely wrong. Okay. What about the next row? We are subtracting a negative value, which is the Y, because it has a sign of one, from X, which is non-negative and we end up with something that is non-negative. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, this is subtraction. So we are subtracting a negative quantity from a non-negative quantity, ending up with a non-negative quantity. Does that happen? Not only should that, does it happen, that's the only way it should happen, okay? <clears throat> so the next one says, we are subtracting a negative quantity, which is y, from a non-negative quantity, which is x, and end up with a negative quantity, which is our d. Can that happen? It should never happen. So we put a one here. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what the zeros and ones mean on the right-hand side of the table? Okay, all right. So the next half is kind of the same thing. Um, you know, on this row here, on row five, we have a negative quantity. We are subtracting a non-negative quantity from a negative quantity, but ending up with a non-negative quantity. Can that happen? Should never happen, right? So we put a one here because you know, this sign, the D2 does not make sense. And then the rest, okay, I'm just going to shortcut a little bit here. <laughs> the rest can all happen, okay? Because you are subtracting a, uh, so this for this row here, you are subtracting a non-negative quantity from a negative quantity, ending up with something that's negative. That's the only way it should happen. And then the last two cases, um, you are subtracting a negative quantity from a negative quantity, and then the result is either non-negative or negative. Yeah, either case can happen. So because if you subtract negative one from negative two, then you have negative one, it is still negative. If you subtract negative two from negative one, you, and then you end up with one, which is positive. So it can happen, it can happen in both ways. So, they are, so that's why they're all you know, zeros on this side. All right, yes? You mean on, the, on this column here? On the other side? They are the sign bits, so if it is a zero, it means, okay, I'm gonna ask you guys for your help, okay? <clears throat> if we're looking at a three-bit number and D2, a three-bit number interpreted signed, if D2, or if the sign bit, the most significant bit is a one, is the quantity being represented negative or non-negative? It has to be negative, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at that, okay? You're looking at three bits, okay? This is one, this is two, and this is negative four. So you can have one, one here, okay? You have one, 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 two, as up to a three, but as soon as you have a neg minus four, the entire quantity is negative one. In other words, no matter how many ones you end up on the non, on the, uh, Everything that is not the most significant bit, you can you can have all ones over there. It still cannot make up for the the quantity of the negative because of the sign bit. So that's why when the sign bit is a one, 
the value, the signed value being represented has to be negative. Yes? I have a question about the second row. Uh-huh. The second row? Yeah, so... Uh-huh, you mean this one? You're looking at this row, is that correct? The middle two. The middle two. Yeah. These two? Yep. Yeah. Yep. It means you know, the sign of the difference is not possible, should not happen. So does that mean on the next one it's not? On the, on the second subtraction, the sign of the Um you are referring to this subtraction? Wait, I'm reading the table on the <laughs> Okay. All right. <clears throat> oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, given that this is the result that we want, okay, we want to come up with a Boolean expression to give us exactly this result here, given that we have x2, y2, and d2. <clears throat> so, the question is, how do I make that happen? Well, as it turns out, there's an easy trick to do this. You look at all the rows that ends up with a 1. Okay, let's focus on this one first. Okay, so the way we make this happen is, okay, we have to make a conjunction out of components of your know, x2, y2, and d2 so, so that it is a 1, but only for this row. Okay, in this case, it's pretty easy. x2, we have to negate it first because it's a 0, so you have to negate it to make it a 1. Um, y2 is already non-negated, so a 1 is good, and d2 is also non-negated, so 1 is good. So this particular conjunction is going to be true only for row 4 in the truth table. Does that make sense to you? <clears throat> because it's looking for exactly x2 has to be a 0, y2 has to be a 1, and D2 also has to be a 1 in order for the conjunction to be a 1. So that means it's going to be a 0 for the rest of the rows. Is that okay? So the other row, which is row 5, which is you know, corresponding to this particular one over here, is exactly kind of the opposite, right? Because when you look at you know, the, the, the patterns of X2, Y2, and D2, they're exactly the opposite. So for that one, we want x2 to be non-negated because it's a 1 to begin with. We want to negate y2 because you know, y2 is a 0 on that row, and we have to negate it in the conjunction to turn it into a 1. And then d2 also needs to be negated because d2 is a 0 on that row. So in a, con in a conjunction, if I want the, enti the entire conjunction to be true, d2 has to be negated. So now we have two conjunctions. One is true only for row four, one is true only for row five, but I want you know, a general expression that is true for, that, it, that works for all the rows. So that's, so what do we do? Just or them together, exactly. So we put an or here, and guess what we call this particular value? Overflow. Because when this expression is true, that means we are overflowing the range of values of the signed representation. In this case, you're given only three bits. Yes? D2 is not that whole thing. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Right, right. Can I use it to flip the sign of D2? No, flipping the sign of D2 does not save you because the problem has to do with the value that you need to represent cannot be represented given only three bits. So flipping just the sign bit 
cannot save you. The only way to save this situation is adding one more bit, which we cannot do, because you know, we have to make sure that the D, the difference, has the same number of bits as X and Y. So, you know, so in other words, we can detect that we have an overflow situation, but there's no way to correct the overflow situation. But I just need to find out whether that is the case or not. All right, so why is overflow important? Overflow is important because the sign bit works for the most part. Okay, so let me just kind of re-quote x minus y is, okay, x is less than y if and only if x minus y is less than zero. So this thing is what allowed us to say, oh, we just have to look at d2. If d2 is a one, then x is less than y in signed interpretation. But it doesn't work all the time because of overflow. When it overflows, then the um, D2 will give you the wrong answer. Is that okay? Okay, let me <clears throat> let me you know, use a new page you know, to, to describe what we are talking about here. So D2 is a one if and only if X, uh, okay, I'm gonna use V as X3 is less than V as Y3 works for the most part until it overflows, okay? So that means, eh, this is like, yeah, for the most part, but not all the time. So of the time that it doesn't work, overflow is gonna be a one. So we are basically having a situation like this. If you ask, the, if you ask D2 and say, and ask, is X less than Y? It will give you the right answer if and only if there's an overflow. If there's an overflow, then D2 will give you exactly the opposite to what it should tell you. Is that okay? And now we have a way to figure out whether there's an overflow or not. So how do we combine D2 that works when there's no overflow, but it lies when there's an overflow, with the overflow flag, the OV flag? So I'll give you the answer. There's an L flag, which is defined as you know, basically D2, which is also called a sign flag, exclusive or with the overflow flag. Okay, so let's check this out, okay? Let's check out this you know, truth table here. So we have, so I'm gonna use you know, S for the sign flag now, which is the most significant bit. D2 is great when we're only working with three bit numbers, but as soon as we work with more bits, you know, D2 doesn't make sense. So I'm just gonna use your know, sign S you know, as the most significant bit of the difference. So we'll just you know, say that S is the most significant bit of the difference. Okay. So let's make a truth table, okay? We have sign, we have the overflow flag, we have the L flag. Sign can be zero, can be one, Overflow can be zero or one when the sign flag is zero. The overflow flag can also be zero or one when the sign flag is one. So because this is exclusive or, so that means that this is a zero, this is a zero, and then we have one, one in between. So now we want to ask, does that make sense? Okay. So we're gonna say L flag is a one if and only if Vs of Xm is less than Vs of y m <clears throat> that's what we want we want to look at one single thing and be able to tell whether the signed value represented by x is less than the signed value represented by y so the question is if i define l as the exclusive or between the sign of the difference and the overflow flag does that achieve what i need to achieve so let's take a look at the truth table so the truth table goes like this. The sign flag says, you know, x minus y is not negative, and the difference is not overflowing. So that means I can trust the sign flag, which means the x is not less than y. Does that make sense to make a conclusion of, nope, no, nope, x is not less than y on the first row? Let's look at row two. On the second row, <clears throat> the sign flag says, nope, x is not less than y, because the difference has a sign flag of a zero. But then I detected there's an overflow situation. 
So when there's an overflow situation, the sign flag of the difference will say opposite to what it's supposed to say. So in this case, the sign flag of the difference says x is not less than y, but it's lying, which means the truth is, yep, it is less than. Does that make sense to you? Okay, let's look at row three. Row three has no overflow. The sign flag of the difference says you know, there's a one, which means x minus y is less than zero. So um, the sign flag says you know, x is less than y, but there's no overflow. So that means I can actually trust the sign flag and conclude that x is less than y. Is that okay? <clears throat> and then the last row means, you know, we do have an overflow situation, which means you know, the difference cannot be stored given the uh, number of bits that we have. The actual sign bit of the difference is a one, which means x minus y ends up with a bit pattern that is negative. But there's an overflow, so that means you know, that sign flag is opposite to what it's supposed to be. So that means we should not, x is not less than y in that case. If there's an overflow, then um, what we call a f these flags will be set. So there, there are uh, some flags that we are talking about here. So when we talk about the B flag in general for M bit, okay, uh, patterns for M bit X, Y, and D, B is basically T of M, which is the most significant, the, 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 the T bit that's hanging out on its own on the left-hand side. Um, o is the overflow, okay, which is you know, what we defined earlier. So overflow is, okay, if you want the actual full expression, it is uh, x, m minus 1, the negation of y, m minus 1, the negation of d, m minus 1, or the negation of x, m minus 1, y, m minus 1, and then d, m minus 1. It is minus one, you know, all of these suffixes are m minus one because we count from zero. So the most significant digit is digit m minus one. Okay, and then the L flag, oh, the sign flag first. The sign flag is basically just, you know, an uh, abbreviation of the most significant, bit, most significant bit of D, the difference. So the sign flag is really just, oh, okay, just take a look at the most significant bit of D and that's, you know, we just abbreviate it to be the sign flag, which is S. And then the L flag is the exclusive or, oops, I have to remember not to touch the bottom of the tablet. So it's the exclusive or between the sign and the overflow flag. So this is not a zero, it's an O. These are O's, okay, let me put an O, V here. So that it's clear this is the overflow flag. So the processor actually maintain these quote-unquote flags after a subtraction so that you can utilize these flags to make decisions later on. Because the idea of a comparison is for decision making. Should I continue with those instructions over there or should I continue with those instructions over there? That is the key. That's the, this is the only decision making mechanism of a processor is whether something is less than something else. Yep. So I'm assuming the reason it doesn't So the flags are set as you do the computation. So if I go back to the previous slides, come on. All right, so I just have to go really slow like that. So for each one of these computation, the processor would actually compute all the flags simultaneously. So for the first one, okay, let me use the mouse pointer because it's, it's just more efficient that way. So for this one, um, this is the sign flag, which is a one. And then we have, you know, um, this is X subscript M minus one. This is Y subscript M minus one. This is D subscript minus one. So in this case, overflow is a zero. 
S is a one, so L is a one, and then B, which is the borrow flag, is a one. So the processor will do all of those computations you know, after each subtraction operation, and then a later instruction can then examine those your know, flags and determine, should I continue with these instructions over here? It can, it can use it to make a decision which way to go. Yep. Yes, but we cannot represent negative five in only three bits. It will just store this as a result. Yeah, and then the, the, the reason why it doesn't just send over negative five is you, you just don't have enough bits, digits, to represent negative five. Yeah, but. But every time you declare an integer, you only have a certain number of bits associated with that integer. You cannot dynamically say, oh, I just need one more bit you know, to represent the result. It doesn't work like that. So when you have, so in a real processor, we don't use only three bits. We have eight, 16, 32, 64, but it's a fixed number. So you, you know, even with 64 bits, there are negative values that you just cannot represent using 64 bits. So the processor will just kind of go like, okay, I know this is the wrong result, but that's all I got. And it will just store 64 bits, even though the result really requires 65 bits you know, to represent it. But it will note, okay, with the overflow flag, it will quote unquote note that, mm, yeah, we got a situation here. Um, so when you store, it will only store the incorrect value. There's no other way to store the result of a subtraction that is out of range. But if that's, well, okay, obviously it's because it can't store the correct right. value, right? But is the reason, like, or, sorry, not the reason, do you ever use the incorrect value processing, or is it just... <laughs> I, I hope you don't. <laughs> so that means, you know, when you are... Uh, declaring the integers, you really should think ahead of time and know whether the width that you have chosen can represent all the values that you can possibly encounter. That should never happen. That is correct. All right. I'm going to take a roll real quick here. Okay. I know it's the end of the class, you know, but since you're all here, might as well take a roll. Uh, let me get out of the student view. <clears throat> and missing today's class is really not a very good idea. But sometimes you know, people get sick and yeah, it's not a they don't they can't do anything about it. But so it should not be hidden anymore. We only got about four, three minutes to type the word O flag, lowercase O and then flag. There should be enough time. If you run out of time, just let me know. Send me an email. And then I'll give you the passcode for tonight's lab. There is a lab tonight. So hopefully it's not going to take as long as the one on Tuesday. This one should not, okay? This one does relate to exactly what we talked about today. So it should not take that long. All right, so let me give you the access code of the lab. All right, so tonight's lab is subtraction and compare, because compare is subtraction, but we pay attention to the flags. <clears throat> and the access code is just flags, pool, all lowercase flags. All right, so I'm going to turn off the recorder and send it out online, and I'll see you guys over at the lab.